Fabulous. Uh, welcome, Klein. Just on the timing, uh, Dr. Brown and I were just looking at the uh, time frame. So the, uh, we, we're working to uh, we'll cut the afternoon tea break, which is scheduled for 1.45 to 2. Uh, it was scheduled 1.40 to, to 2. We'll cut, if you don't mind, the uh, afternoon tea break down to a quarter of an hour. So Dr. Klein's got through to all that. Uh, to so he's going to do his best to uh, to, to run through the therapies. With regards to timekeeping, Judith uh, mentioned to me that we are not quite on such a, a tight schedule plan, and we might uh, bring in some little cup of tea or something like that, but keep going with our talk, which is again we allowed. So he encar she encouraged me to just keep going. Yeah. And, but uh, yeah. Professor Demopoulos will be coming in at 2 o'clock. So, so we right. need to be ready. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. that's the message. It's hard uh, sitting through three lectures and then onto the fourth one, isn't it, with other stuff. Um, first of all, I just, uh, I'm just amazed at how many people turn up for this talk or this session. Robin Strong is certainly not a common condition, as you've heard. Um, I just wish to we emphasize the fact that some of you indeed will be extremely knowledgeable um, going through internet and getting all up-to-date information and some of you maybe less so. So I'm trying to pitch at someone in the middle so um, I apologize in advance and if you want to stop me at any time please do so. This is not mine. <laughs> Talks that he's going to give. We have five minutes to just grab a cup of tea and grab something to eat and then we'll come back and bring it with you, okay? Now, the title is tricky. I bracket in Australia. That was what I was given. And part of the reason that some of you are aware that although we talk about treatments and especially emerging treatments and novel therapies, many of those are actually not ready available in this country. We are not the worst in the world, we are certainly not the best. And uh, we certainly have um, a few of these agents available, but as you can see at the end of it, I'll summarize the tricky situation as to the access to therapies. Um, guidelines are tricky. Whenever you see guidelines, um, you then have to see the strength of the recommendations. There is such a, an extreme lack of solid data, and in fact, as you can see there, there is only the first published randomized study was only this year. And largely because the numbers of patients is so small, it's very hard to get solid data. So far, all the guidelines that will come across, whether it's from America or from the uh, WM Foundation, are expert opinions rather than coming from good randomized trial. Um, if you look at the last two published very good uh, indolent lymphoma trial, one of which we actually took part in the Bright study and we had with quite a few patients, you can see that the numbers 11 of the 447 in our study and the slightly larger study which was published slightly ahead of us, 41 of the 514 are patients with WM or the counterpart called the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. So you can see that it's very hard to do a study on modern strong patients themselves. And there's a huge variation as a time to treat. Now the patient now is about 10 years and I'm still following without treatment. He would be here today except his wife is having surgery today, otherwise we meet him. Um, Cure is an interesting word because there is such a thing as a functional cure. In other words, you still have the disease, but effectively it's not as affecting your lifespan. So hopefully for myeloma and for Wolfenstrom's, we are at least achieving a functional cure for many patients. But I do think there's a spark in there because with the knowledge available, especially myeloma, I think we are starting to really talk about cure and I think that time will come. 
Um, so the, the bottom there, 0.2% uh, of the New South Wales cancer statistics um, um, are Wardenstrom's patients, and it's only a few hundred, uh, as you said, uh, per year. 0.2% of all cancers. And this is the famous first published randomized trial in 2013, and it compares with a good old drug called Corambosol. It has been around longer than I've been around. <laughs> And it's always nice to hit an old drug, isn't it? Because obviously it wouldn't be bad. <laughs> um, it's important um, to recognize what are the triggers for treatment. Um, as you would have heard by now, um, many patients actually do not require treatment and may not do so for a long time. So what actually trigger um, treatment? The first thing would be so-called the weeds crowding up the garden. I actually thought within that box was the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> Until you pointed out that they are vegetables. <laughs> they're just very tall weeds. <laughs> you should come to my garden and you realize that. <laughs> so, of course, with the bone marrow being crowded up, you have low blood counts. And the fact that you have a tumor, and sometimes because of a bulk of tumor, or sometimes the body responds to the tumor can generate little molecules in the body that make you feel fatigued and other constitutional symptoms like fever, sweats, and weight loss. Viscosity is a big problem, and, and you have seen the diagrammatic representation of the IgM molecule. It's a huge molecule. That's what's called macroglobulin. And because of that, it tumbles in the blood and circulates in a very clumsy manner. So the blood cake becomes thick and circulation is impaired. And typically, a uh, patient may have nose bleeds because in the nose, the blood vessels are very superficial. And if you've got sludging of blood there, it sort of becomes distended and very easy to bleed there. It's very um, typical. Impaired vision because of the back of your eyes, the retina, the blood flow is sludged. Typically, the patient can have headaches and have a whole range of neurological issues. In some patients, the in proliferation of cells can lead to enlargement of lymph, uh, lymph nodes and liver and spleen. Uh, neuropathy is very important, but here I have to stress, in these patients, the neuropathy may not be due to WM, because patients are elderly, it may be from diabetes. So don't jump to conclusions. It's very important to actually find out what the neuropathy is due to. And in fact, there are studies that can be done to tell the difference. Bone disease in WM is extremely rare, as distinct from myeloma. WM behaves more like a lymphoma. IgM myeloma is extremely rare. Neuropathy due to IgM is seen in up to about 20% of patients, and commonly it is uh, sensory disturbances, uh, as you've heard from Dr. Cunningham. And these are some of the tests you can do, especially uh, empty mag antibody. It is available. It is actually done at St. Vincent's Hospital, and uh, also I strongly advise that the patient should have conduction studies. In other words, needles put into the nerve and muscle to see how the nerves uh, are, are behaving, and even up to a nerve biopsy, because it is important to show that there is IgM deposits on the nerves before you conclude that it's due to Wallenstrom's. And as you've heard, the mechanism of disturbance is because of this breakdown of insulation. Basically, the conduction of uh, nerve impulses, instead of jumping from a node to node, you have no insulation and basically just go entirely haywire. Dr. Robert Carl is a huge name in myeloma, and that was published in 2003. And to be honest, you can read the latest recommendations, they have not changed much. Essentially because it is a low-grade disease, you're still waiting for triggers, and the triggers have not changed. So you can see um, anemia, low platelets, uh, viscosity getting higher than a certain value. Um, neuropathy is interesting because I think most patients, many patients of most, will require treatment simply because of the uh, mild disturbance uh, of, from, from neuropathy. IgM is an interesting protein. Um, it, I often call it a cold protein or cryoprotein. So it can cause clumping of red cells that can produce its own problems like very blue and painful fingers, or sometimes this protein can cause breakdown of red cells. So when that happens, the patient also needs treatment. You can look this up 
on the web if you haven't done so already from the American NCCM or National Cancer something uh, guidelines. And this is probably the latest, although uh, Professor Demopoulos did point out to a recent um, meeting, but in fact the guidelines are much the same and they are not published. This is the only, the most recent published guidelines I can find. You're not supposed to read this, <laughs> but it does give you a, what they uh, show if you were able to get a copy of that. And that is, it has how you uh, diagnose the condition, how you do the workup, and then the treatment, and then further down the page, what happens if the patient relapses. So the indications for treatment are there, much like what I've shown you before. And the primary treatment includes plasmapheresis, which is just basically trying to remove the plasma and uh, replace it with something thinner, or primary therapy, which is either single agent or a combination therapy. The fact is to consider when we start the patient on treatment is you have to look for a clinical reason to treat and not on a laboratory result. And that is actually not unique to this condition. Um, sometimes doc doctors make the mistake of looking at the result and then say, oh, I have to start treatment. But I think we have to look at the patient as well. And as, and as I pointed out, at least when you work with it, sometimes you do have to look for alternative explanations for the symptoms. Like a patient with a numb, numb foot. It could be just from uh, 40 years of smoking, for instance. Um, the age of the patient, comorbidities are important, and you have to consider the toxicities of drug that you're going to employ. There is no drug that has no side effects. And especially for younger patients, that you think a uh, possibility of a stem cell transplant can be on the horizon, you should avoid uh, drugs that poison the stem cells because you are effectively trying to think of a stem cell transplant later on as salvage. The patient or the family preferences and expectations are important, and also in Australia, of course, the previous listing, which is crucial. It's fine to say, I want drug X, it's marvelous, but can you get it? Complementary medicine, we take it for granted that the great majority of patients take it. Uh, we don't believe it has a substantial um, effect on the disease itself, but um, it probably uh, enhances the patient's uh, <coughs> general well-being. And as long as you tell the doctor what you're taking, I think it should be fine. I don't think I will spend too much time on plasmapheresis. Um, it's a, a word that basically means uh, to take away. Um, we can use it as an adjunctive treatment it is not a definitive treatment. You're just skimming off whatever is causing the thick blood. So if you do not follow up with some treatment, it will bounce back. And typically it will bounce back probably in about a week, but it bounces you time. In some cases, you might have heard, especially with rituximab, for a period of two to three months, in, in, paradoxically, the IgM may actually go up after treatment. We call it a flare. And in fact, you can actually do a preemptive plasmapheresis to get down the argent before you start the rituximab. And for those we have, um, for those who have seen such patients undergoing the procedure, with some of the patient coming in um, heart moribund because of, um, of the problem with the brain, you'd be amazed how quickly it works. The, the patient can literally wake up at the end of the procedure. It's quite remarkable. Rituximab as a single agent is effective. The IgM we've talked about, but more commonly it is uh, combined with something else. IMIT stands for immunomodulatory drug, and the prime example, the first generation is thalidomide, then you have lenidomide, third generation is pomalidomide, and more mites further down the track. Proteasome inhibitors are drugs that um, um, mark up the protein salvage pathway within the cells. Now both WM cells or organ strong cells and myeloma cells make a lot of protein. And as such, the whole cell machinery is um, uh, designed to handle a lot of protein in the body. So the proteasome are little organelles that actually handle these proteins. If you stop them up, the cell will die. So these, this group of drugs is called proteasome inhibitors, and the prime example, the first generation is Velcade. Interestingly, intolerance to rituximab in strong patients is unusually high. And in fact, 
Dr. Coming out a patient who basically had to come in every time to have rituximab, and in fact, even there has, has extraordinary reaction. Although it is useful to treat patient neuropathy, sometimes the potential <coughs> problems of neuropathy and even the cold protein problems are referred to. Don't discount chlorambrosol. It's an exceedingly old drug, but it still works. And as you can see from this uh, report published this year, chlorambrosol at the bottom, progression uh, free, which means uh, the disease doesn't progress, the median is actually 27 <coughs> months, with an overall survival of 70 months. So in some patients, it's actually quite um, uh, indicated to actually use chlorambrosol. Combinations, uh, Professor Demopoulos referred to the combination DRC, which is his favorite combination, works extremely well. It stands for rituximab, a steroid called dexamethasone, and an alkylating agent called cyclophosphamide. Or you can use protocols like polymphomus, rituximab with combination of CVP or CHOP. Or you can combine with thalidomide, lanidomide, or a nucleoside analog, the prime example is fludarabine. Just a word about fludarabine. It is very effective, but it has its own unique side effects. Look, uh, note that the risk of transformation to leukemia or uh, one run down while it is placed in 10 to 15 percent. And in fact, we also know quite recently that it can uh, increase the risk of transformation to a high grade lymphoma. And it's also not friendly to stem cells. So if you have a slightly younger patient who you think you may be doing transplant in the future, do not use fludarabine as your first choice. Bendamastine, that was one of the trials we were invest, uh, involved in. And indeed, um, it's a new old drug. It came from East Germany. It's um, a very interesting drug. And by the time it came over to the Western world, a lot of the original data apparently could not be located. But it is a very interesting drug. It is now very much publicized in our own literature. And just to show you this comparison, where within that study, they isolated the patients with lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, which is the lymphoma counterpart of Waldenstrom. And you can see that using bendamustin and rituximab in the red line um, compares <coughs> extremely well to a rather conventional combination of rituximab and CHOP treatment, which is like lymphoma. So in summary, the frontline treatment, first of all, for symptomatic um, thick blood, you can do plasmapheresis. You can certainly use single agent at the start, either rituximab or chlorambrosol in selected patients with the proviso that you can get hold of rituximab. Rituximab-based therapies uh, are generally preferred as an initial treatment as pointed out by Professor Demopoulos. And probably at the moment, um, probably the combination of DRC would be my choice. Uh, but also, combination of thalidomide are suitable because none of these would poison the stem, uh, the stem cells. So DRC, the outshot, or the combination of thalidomide. But since thalidomide itself can cause neuropathy, it would not be my first choice. Um, for patients with uh, viscous blood, the, the cold protein problem, uh, you can use combination with Velcade in it. For bulky disease, you can go with bendamustine. Uh, with very aggressive disease, you will combine it with nucleoside analogs such as fludarabine. For neuropathy, you can use rituximab or DRC. And interestingly, for those who respond to rituximab, maintenance of rituximab has been found to be useful. Now, this is just to give you a taste of what <coughs> Professor Demopoulos will talk about in the emerging therapy, especially ibrutinib. Just concentrate on this little molecule here. Where is it? This one, mid-88. Now, as with any disease these days, if you find, can find a gene that is responsible, either solely responsible or larger responsible, you, you then can stop, start to talk about targeted therapy. Now, it is not as though that they have developed a trust specifically for mid-88, which is a mutation found in well over 90% of patient Waldenstrom's. 
But nevertheless, MIP-88 in, is involved in several pathways, part of which can be blocked by this drug, which he talked about, called ebritinib. And this is how it works. Ebritinib works here, and the MIP-88 is there, so it blocks this part. And when you block this part, the cellular pathways cannot proceed down uh, towards something we call NF kappa B, which interestingly is also important in myeloma. The bottom line is it has, uh, um, the initial uh, report was extremely impressive. First 35 patients reported rapid response and uh, in IgM, median for six months, only one progressed and received breakthrough approval in FDA. Finally, the drug access. For a drug to be available to us or to you, first of all, it has to re receive TJ listing. When that's listed, it means you can buy it. Someone can buy it. And then, of course, the next step is to wait for PBS listing, which means that the uh, government sees fit to subsidize the treatment. Now, nowadays, there is no cheap treatment. All these good new drugs cost at least tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and then after that, you still have to see whether the hospital puts it in the formulary. And then there's a difference between public hospital versus a private hospital. And some years ago, there was a difference between Victoria and New South Wales. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things in the middle that need sorting out. And there are other avenues. Uh, for example, maybe you can negotiate with your private uh, health insurers if you have uh, medical insurance, because they may come to pay maybe 50% of it. Some companies will say you pay for the first X number of injections and will provide the rest free. Some hospitals have drug companies you can approach. In other words, it may not be available at first pass, but perhaps you should um, negotiate uh, uh, with your doctor to see if the doctor can suggest something. Thank you. I just checked is still talking next door. So we have a few more minutes and maybe we could take just a couple of questions. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to. Um, uh, yes, please. Oh, just a question. Uh, the time I mentioned the genetics for a couple of weeks. Is there any test that may be available? Uh, not at this stage, uh, unless it's in a. Um, a Bench to bedside. Could be uh, genetic abnormality that accompanies. Certainly, undoubtedly, quantum has to describe the you can meat. Clarify your question. Do you talk, are you talking about a testing to predict whether someone may have the condition? You might have it in the family. Sort of that thing. is not available. Although no. you may be referring to the fact that maybe about twenty percent of patients have a first degree relative involved in obesity disorder. Yeah. So this mid mutation is an acquired one. It's not something that you can pass on. Though it's highly sensitive and specific, so it's go, it's likely to become a marker, but not in a routine sense at this stage. Um, uh, and so, unfortunately, you know, the answer is no. On the other hand, as it emerges as a as a diagnostic tool, it will probably lead to, as as uh, Klein pointed out, a therapeutic target. Any other questions? Yeah. When the nerve cells are damaged, as in uh, myelinia, or myelinia, does the chemotherapy actually make that worse again because it's got access to it that can interaction? indeed. Though not necessarily the the uh, coating, but the actual nerves. Yes, the, the actual uh, so you can imagine when that's combined with an underlying problem of the um, of the actual condition, it can be a problem. So Which is why uh, Dr. Kwan suggested that uh, thalidomide may not be the ideal drug because it is accompanied by a significant uh, side effect of uh, peripheral neuropathy. Neuropathy can be disabling, and the the biggest mistake is to treat it too late because let's say if you try to treat it after two or three years, the damage is permanent. And it's also indeed slowly progressive, so certainly it's a good trigger for treatment, but very unusual in this condition. And a follow-up question to that, that, that then is ad, ad infinitum, it goes on forever, that damage keeps causing you difficulties or does it heal itself 
No, that, that damage is clearly disease related, so it is a trigger for treatment. Treatment usually works, and that should stop the neuropathy from progressing if not actually improved. It should not uh, continue once you start treatment. Okay, shall we maybe just break now? Yes. Um,